I'm going to approach it from a slightly different uh, angle today to kind of um, the, the kind of help us see sin and its destructive power. Because guys, sometimes we trivialize sin. We go through and we act like, oh, sin isn't that bad. I can get away with this. I can get away with that. You know, it's like a little white lie isn't a big deal. You know, I can I can fudge on my taxes here a little bit just to, you know, save a few bucks. Or or I can uh, I can look at that smut on the internet a little bit. No one's gonna know. Or or you know, I can I can I can hit that joint. No big deal. You know, it's like no one's gonna know about it. And and we think we think it's not that bad. It's not that destructive. And there's all kinds of sins that we do that that fit into that category. Like with my kids, they might think, oh, it's not that bad if if mommy and daddy say they clean the room and 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 I and I don't do it today or I just do it halfway. I'm not hurting anyone. It's 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 okay. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. It's not like I'm going out and murdering someone, or it's not like I'm going out and and stealing a car. You know, and that's what we do. We trivialize sin. We we put some sins above others. We we uh, act like there's big lies, small lies. That somehow porn isn't as bad as adultery, or hate isn't as bad as as murder or whatever. And that's not the case at all. All sin, no matter how how big or small it is, has a corrupting, destructive nature to it. And it destroys something and harms something. And I'm kind of wanting to go uh, through that today. But in Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 21 through 23, Paul uh, asks us a simple question. It says, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? In other words, once you're saved, you become ashamed of your sin. You no longer want to do it. You're, 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 you still sin. You know, Romans 7 says, you know, I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do is what I practice. But we're ashamed of what we do. We, we tend to hide it. As a Christian, we tend to hide it. We tend to do it in the shadows. We don't want people to know because we're ashamed of it. And we all have sin that we're ashamed of. But it says, what fruit did you have when you do the things that you're now ashamed? It says, for even... For the end, uh, for the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, having become slaves to God, you have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, so that's the context of Romans six twenty three, guys. Is is the context is is we're supposed to be set free from those things that we are now ashamed of that we're. We, we die to it instead of allowing it to kill us. So we're ashamed of it. And uh, that would manifest itself in a couple different ways. Look at, like, like, look at what Moses uh, did. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. See, and that kind of tells you what... We're looking at here Romans. Uh, that's Hebrews eleven twenty four through twenty five. The idea is sin. Look at the verse there. Sin has passing pleasures. It has passing pleasures. Sin feels good. It gratifies the flesh. Guess what? We like it. We like it. It wouldn't be a temptation if we didn't like it. But. As we saw, the problem with this is we like something that is destructive, right? We like something that's destructive. And as I tell my kids, you want to think of God's law not as a barrier between us and fun. Imagine someone riding towards a cliff on the back of a horse and, and someone saying, hey, stop, There's don't jump over that barricade, you know, there's a cliff there and them saying, nah, that barricade just meant to hold me back. I'm going to jump over it. And then they fall to their death. It's like, no, it's not a fence. It's a guardrail. And that's the way that God works. His law isn't a fence that keeps us from fun. It's more like a guardrail on the side of a road. It's more like a guardrail on the side of a road. And we've got to remember that. We've got to understand that. So we need to kill the sin in our life and walk with God. And there's, a, and there's a couple reasons why in Romans 1 that we're going to see. 
And the first reason is sin goes against the glory and image of God. Remember, we have to realize something. Why were we created? We were created to give God glory. We were created to have a relationship with him. We were created to, have a, to be an accurate image of who he is. But when we sin, we are no longer that accurate image. We are now an inaccurate image. So let's look at what Paul says there. In, in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So they know who God is, but they suppress it. As I've said many times before, that the Greek word for suppress is the, is the Greek word to hold down. It was used in secular literature to describe someone holding someone's head underwater to drown them. So the idea of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness is drowning God's truth, trying to kill it. That's the, that's the idea that Paul is conveying there. They suppress or try to kill God's truth and unrighteousness to get rid of it because they don't want it being an authority over them. So they try to kill it. They try to kill it. They, it's like they put their head on it. They hold it underwater. And, and that's the word picture there. Because look at verse 19. Because what be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. They know God is there. They know God is real. They know God is an authority. And they ignore him, turn their backs on him, and try their best to drown him out. And how do they know God's there? For verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and God has so that they are without excuse. That Greek word for uh, at, without excuse there means without apologia. It means uh, we get apologetics from it. It's without a courtroom defense. On judgment day, they will be without ex, uh, defense. When they stand before God and they say, uh, and God says, why did you suppress my truth and uh, unrighteousness? Why did you act like I wasn't there? Why did you not believe in me? Why did you not trust in me? They're, they're going to be without excuse because God's like, hey, I gave you the creation. Where did this creation come from? It either create it, you only have three choices: either created itself, it always exists, or someone created it. Uh, created it, and the first two are impossible. So you know I was there. Why did you bow the knee and seek me? They're without excuse. Instead, they twisted God. They drowned His truth out. They either turn Him into an idol or deny His existence. Period. That's it. So that's where we're coming at here. So they're drowning the truth. So as you can see here, what are they doing? They're not being an accurate image of God. They're like, we're not submitting to God. We're going to make our own God, or we're going to make ourselves into God. So let's look at verse 21 here. Because all they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile in their thoughts, uh, just means they became vain. They became empty. They became pointless. They had no standard to rest upon. They became their own standard. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. And verse 23 is the big one here. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They so what was point one again? They chain the, the sin goes against the glory and image of God. They change the glory of God. Instead of glorifying God, what does sin do? It rips God's glory from them. It it rips His majesty from them. It rips His glory from them. It rips our purpose from them. And it says, "I'm going to become my own authority. I am going to make God into my image. I am going to be the master of my own domain." Do you, do you hear that? I, 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 I. It's ripping God's glory away and it's destroying his image. That is what sin does in one way or another. Every time a child disobeys a, a, their parents, it remember, the family is a picture of the Trinity. The father of the family is a picture of God the Father. 
The son or the children is a picture of, 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 of Christ, and the mother is a picture of the spirit. You got that. So any time that kids disobey their parents, they are refusing to be an accurate image of what Jesus did when their parents on earth. Jesus perfectly <laughs> obeyed the Father through the Spirit. When, when we as humans refuse to obey our parents, we say, I'm not going to be an accurate image of that. I'm going to rip that image from them. I'm going to rip that glory from them. And I'm going to do my own thing because I want to. When we're unfaithful to a spouse, that, that, is, the, that is the equivalent of, of saying, hey, I'm not going to be faithful to my spouse like God's faithful to me. I'm going to be an inaccurate image. You see how it rips the glory and the image from God. That's what sin does. It's not innocent, guys, even if no one knows about it. God does, and it's destroying his image. It's destroying his glory, and he takes it seriously. That's why there's chastisement involved. Because remember, Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. But once we're in sin, what do we do? You do the deeds of your, this is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You do the deeds of your father. And they said, we have, we were born, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. See, they're accusing Jesus of being born of fornication. You know, so stuff was going around that, that Mary was knocked up before she was married. You know, so that was kind of a slam on, on Jesus there. We have one father, God, but look at what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come, uh, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you were not able to listen to my word? You are of your father, the devil. Boy, there's Jesus just laid it right out, right? Gilberto says that all the time. Jesus didn't pull any punches. He just spoke as bluntly as possible. You are as you are of your father, the devil. Period. And and he goes on and says, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in here. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. <laughs> it's like, whoa, Jesus, there you go, bud. You know, it's the Lord just lay it out there for you, man. But look at what he says there. He's like, you are not being an accurate image of God. You're being an accurate image of your father. See, that's the thing. When we sin, that's the crux of the issue. We're no longer being an accurate image of God. We're being an accurate image of someone else. Which side are you taking? Who are you worshiping? Who are you mimicking? Remember, Paul says that imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. That word imitate in the Greek is mimic. Like a child would mimic its parents. Who are you mimicking? God? Jesus, or are you mimicking the God of this world? Which one is it? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So sin goes against the glory and image of God, but look at verses 24 through 27. Sin goes against the natural order of God's creation right there. And guys, we're going to touch on something that's very sensitive here, but look at the verse. Therefore, God gave them, up, give, gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. But look at the next verse. For this reason, God gave them up the vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. 
Likewise, also, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what's shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. It's homosexuality. Right there. And, and, that, and that's why the, the Bible uses homosexuality as the poster child sin of leaving the natural order of things. And that's just the beginning. Any sin causes us to leave the natural order of things. And, and we have to remember that God created this world as uh, to have a certain order, to have a certain nature to it. And sin, where it rejects God's truth and unrighteousness, it's got to replace it with something else. Well, if you, got God, if you have God's truth and you reject God's truth, well, if you're not going to hold to God's truth, you, what's your natural tendency? To hold to the exact opposite of God's truth. <laughs> so if God says, okay, I want one man and one woman forever in marriage, it's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a man and a man and a woman and a woman. It's not going to be forever. We're going to get divorced two months later. And uh, I'm going to have uh, three or four, five, six, seven wives throughout the course of my year. So, and if you're a Mormon, you're going to have them all at the same time and, and, and everything else. Uh, and, and whenever, whenever the, whenever the, uh, the human element grows, uh, whenever the human element grows, you know, uh, the novelty wears off. It's like, okay, I'm going to start going after children just because the adults isn't good. So you know, we're going to evolve into pedophilia now. But whenever that don't hit you, ah, let's just go ahead and get even more gross with it. Let's just go ahead and go down to bestiality because, hey, where does it end? It just evolves. It just evolves. And that's the point. You leave the natural order of things. It's just a damn little spiral from there. Can't stop it. Can't stop it. And... And that is what sin does. Uh, Psalm 81, 12. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk after in their own counsels. If you don't have the uh, if you don't have the truth of God, all you've got left is whatever's in your heart. You're a you're a law unto yourself. First Thessalonians first Thessalonians 1 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn from God from idols to serve the true and living God. And that's what God's command is. It's like stop doing this. Place your trust in your image and start mimicking the right image, guys. That's what we do. But the last point here, we need to kill the sin in our life and walk with God because, number one, sin goes against the glory and image of God. Number two, sin does, it goes against the natural order of God's creation. But lastly, sin goes against the good of all people. It goes against the good of all people. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, again, they're suppressing God's truth, so they're not retaining him. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, which is a, which is a, uh, a slander, backbiter, which is a gossip. Uh, Haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, and mental of evil, evil things, disobedient to their parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unwor uh, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Isn't that our culture now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Totally. It's like, it not that our culture now, Gilberto? Right on the head. Mm -hmm. And where did it all start? The suppression of God. See, it, uh, in one way or another, every sin is hurtful to another person. It is, in one way or another. If you don't show up to, if you don't show up to church, someone in the church is lacking fellowship. And so are you. You know, if you lie, you're you're hurting yourself. Number one, because your your trustworthiness is going down. But now, you're hurting others because they can't trust you, so they can't rely on you. 
And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Every sin, it's damaging in one way or another. Nothing is innocent. Nothing is okay. Everything has some sort of destructive power to it. But look at what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 16 through 19. So Jesus said, are you also still with understanding? This is after he was accused of not washing his hands before he ate. Do you not yet understand? And the, and the, and the uh, disciples are asking, what did he mean by a parable? He said, do you, not, uh, do you not yet understand that whatever goes into the mouth, uh, enters the mouth, goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those uh, things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. It's already there. It's already there. We've been given over to it. So, guys, I challenge you. Think about that last point. Think about any sin you can think of and say, is it truly innocent? Does, does it, is it truly a little innocent sin that doesn't hurt anybody? Think about the most innocent things you can do. Like, like being lazy and not wanting to get up and go to work and call in to work. It's like, I ain't hurting him. No, it's hurting people. Who's picking up your little slack at work? Right? It's hurting people. Absolutely. I mean, covetousness. Who's that hurting? Well, that's hurting a lot because now you're, you're discontent. And discontentment spawns all kinds of different stuff. Now you might become a workaholic. Now you might become jaded and, and say, well, I'm not going to be happy. So you're always moping around and being sad, making everyone else around you miserable. There's all kinds of stuff. No sin is innocent. Every sin hurts someone in some way. As, a, as the last point says, sin goes against the good of all people. Sometimes it's your, sometimes it's yourself, sometimes it's those around you, sometimes it's God, but it goes against the good of all people. We have to remember that. So we need to kill sin in our life and walk with God because, number one, sin goes against the glory and image of God. Number two, sin goes against the natural order of God's creation. Number three, sin goes against the good of all people. There's nothing good about it, guys. It's destructive, it's corrupt, it's abnormal, it's not part of God's original creation. And he wants it gone because, mainly, because of point one. It goes against his glory and image. And he's all about his glory and image, and he's got to destroy anything that doesn't fall into that glory and image. And, of course, that's where Christ comes in. When we sin, he has to destroy us because we're good, and he's holy. But that's where Jesus comes in because he came down, he took on human flesh, became a man, fully God, fully man at the same time, living a perfect life. And when he was rejected and nailed on that cross, he took the sins of the world upon himself, dying in our place, and was buried and rose again. And the Bible says that, um, that if we trust in him and verbally say we trust that you're God's son, that you died and rose again, taking the punishment for our sins, and ask for that forgiveness, apart from any good works at all, he saves us. It'd be the same thing as, like, once again, me stealing Oscar's car, being caught red-handed, standing before a human judge and saying, you know what? The, and the human judge saying, Brian, I know, I know you're guilty, but if you trust me, I'll go to jail for you. Same thing. Mm -hmm. It's what Jesus did. Substitutionary death. All sin is a capital punishment. Someone has to die. It's either going to be us or it's going to be him. we got to take that choice. we got to make that choice. He died in our place if we'll accept it by faith. But let's pray. Father, thank you for our day, Lord. Thank you for the great meeting with John John and for the uh, for just your love and, and everything that you've done for us, Lord. Be with us and bring us back safe uh, next time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.